hello again my friends and uh, welcome once more to the Invisible College. And we have a good one for you this week. It's called The Lost Tribes of Israel and the Scythians. Now, as you know, I've been doing this whole series on the Lost Tribes of Israel. And we've got a few more programs to do in due course. But the last one we did was concerning the Chimerians and how they um, became, eventually they came into Europe uh, to become the Gauls and Celts and how the uh, the Chimerians were actually descended from the lost tribes of Israel. And now we're going to be looking at the Scythians. And this is going to be highly controversial. I know it is. Um, because everything you'll read in the textbooks, in uh, on the media, everything you'll see, will tell you that the Scythians, or the Scute, came from southern Russia, in, in, on actually southern Siberia. There were nomads, horsemen, who came from the east, riding in on their horses and destroying things and conquering things, and eventually he ended up in Europe. But we're going to be looking at the evidence, much deeper evidence, actually in records that uh, tell us who these really were. And they were not these, these Mongol-type tribesmen from the east, they were something different, and that's what we were going to be dealing with today. So, the lost tribes of Israel and the Scythians. Um, now, before you start, I've been talking about these pamphlets. Uh, I bought these in 1973, um, and that's what we've been basing our talks, the last talks on. And we did this one, the Lost Tribes in the Assyrian Records, and that went into the whole Chimerian uh, question and the origins of the Gauls and Celts. This one, uh, also by the same author, W.E. Filmer. Uh, I don't know what the W stands for, perhaps it's William, but the E is Edmund Filmer, who was living in the 20th century, and uh, I think probably died sometime in the 80s, I think, or maybe 90s. Um, but he was obviously a very intelligent man and a great researcher, and I have huge respect for his work. And that's why I'm bothering to do this, because I don't know anyone else who's got into this level of um, detail and searching in actual uh, records of Assyrian places to find the evidence for making these assertions. Plenty of people make assertions, it's not hard to do that, but to actually find evidence to back up what you're saying. That's something else and something much more difficult. And actually, you can find these, these documents on the internet now. And I'm going to provide you um, with a link to this, this paper. Uh, you can read it for free on the internet. Uh, someone's put it there. Not me, but someone's put it there. He also wrote that there's also this little booklet or... Um, this is published by the British Israelites, I think, uh, Covenant Brooks. So you can get hold of that on Amazon. It doesn't cost you very much. and It gives you a synopsis of all of this. But I do like these pamphlets. There's some things you've got more in these, and there's other things you've got more in this. So they actually work together very well. Now, I've based these lectures on the scholarship contained in two pamphlets, which I just showed you, both by W. Edmund Filmer. I purchased these in 1973. Filmer, like many older generation British of his day, was a British Israelite. This is to say he believed that the British, and therefore their diaspora nations, including the USA, are the modern remnants of the lost tribes of Israel. If true, they had inherited, for good or bad, certain biblical prophecies. And Filmer's pamphlets were his evidence for proving this assertion, so they deserve careful scrutiny. Before we go on with that, um, I just want to say a little bit about th this whole notion of British Israelitism. Um, 
it's something that you can find traces of this. I found going all the way back to the 6th century, actually, in the writings of Gildas. And you find references to Britain as Israel in certain letters of Queen Elizabeth I and Oliver Cromwell. So this is actually quite an old idea, but it wasn't widely spread until the Victorian age. And in the mid-Victorian period, um, this whole notion of how Britain was the lost Israel, you could say, um, became a major movement. And you can see why people might be thinking this. This was the time of the British Empire was growing and taking control. It became the most powerful empire in the world. Um, uh, controlling not just um, a quarter of the the uh, the uh, population of the world, but also important places, you know, the uh, maritime trade routes. Uh, the British Empire patrolled the sea. Britannia ruled the waves, as we said. So you can see how right up until the First World War, this was something that was, um, among certain circles, was very, very prevalent. And in fact, uh, I've written elsewhere how the, the British in the First World War deliberately set out to capture Jerusalem before the end of 1917 because they believed that that was what was prophesied. And in fact, they did. They captured Jerusalem from the Turks without a, a, a shot being fired, which is extraordinary. Um, anyway, so there was this, this general notion that Britain in particular was the lost Israel and the, the throne of Britain was the throne of David. And I'll go into that in a later lecture. Now, we can be very sceptical about that in our day because the British Empire has long since gone, hasn't it? But at the time Filmer was writing, he had grown up in that ambience. Um, and he taking it for granted that the British were definitely the Israelites. I look at it as slightly differently. Um, I look at it that, yes, um, maybe the British are descended from the lost tribes of Israel. Actually, I, I believe all of Western Europe is. Um, probably some of Eastern as well. Um, that's where the Lost Tribes went, but that they were mixed in with other peoples who were there. So it's a bit like um, if you uh, say you got a, a a glass of brandy. Let's let's say you got a glass of brandy, and you take this glass of brandy, and you got a bowl of water, and you pour it into the bowl of water. Yes, your brand is in the water, but it's now much more diluted. And I think that's kind of how I see it. Um, I'm not a racist. I'm not interested in that. I think I do believe that everyone has a right to get to the kingdom of heaven. It's not restricted to any one nation or race or anything like that. Uh, it's actually, you know, we're all sons of Adam, aren't we? But there are prophecies in the Bible which relate directly to Israel, the northern Israel, as well as the southern Israel, which was called Judah. And the Jews are descended from the southern Israelites. The northern Israelites disappeared from history. But they have to be refound. We have to know what happened to them because there are prophecies about them. So that's why I go into this subject in some depth, because it's not just for the sake of notionally the British or French or whoever, to say, ah, you know, I'm an Israelite. That's not what it's about at all. It's really about vindicating the Bible and what the Bible prophesies. You have to find what happened to the lost tribes. Where did they go? What happened to them? And where, what's going to be expected of them now? The other side to it, I would also add, is I see the fall of the British Empire... Um, as being kind of karmic to a large extent. Um, yes, we weren't perfect by any means. We did a lot of good, I think. I know it's, that's a view that's not shared by many young people who've never really studied history. But Britain did bring civilization. It brought reading and writing. It taught people you know, better ways of living, 
brought sanitation, brought the ability to grow crops better, things like this. And the, in general, the, the countries we left behind when we, you know, dis, it was disbanded, um, were generally much more prosperous than they are now. Uh, you know, uh, many of these countries became basket cases once, once the British pulled out. So it wasn't all bad. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure there were some bad things that was done as well, and I'm not going to whitewash. But um, on the whole, I think it did a lot of good, and it spread the Christian religion to the four corners of the world, which was also the duty of Israel. So this is, you know, there are reasons for thinking there's something in this. But anyway, we're going to go into this lecture, and we're going to look at what film has to say about our Scythian ancestors and the evidence that he produces for this. I was impressed by Filmer's scholarship, and I remain so today. Unlike many authors, he investigated primary sources. In particular, he made use of English translations of the vast archive of Assyrian tablets that made up the library of Ashur Banipal, Assyria's last great king. This traces the history of Israel's deportations, confirming biblical history. And I think that's a point that needs to be made. Um, you know, up until the discovery of this library of Ashur Banipal, it was possible for, let's call them skeptics, um, uh, to dismiss the Bible and say, this is all fiction anyway. You know, these Jews, they just wrote this, these things and it didn't exist. And there's no Israel and it was never existed. It's a figment of their imagination. And you can just dismiss all that. Well, Ashur Badipal's library gives you date, dates almost to the day of certain events and uh, all about the Assyrian Empire and its growth and the different kings who rule and gives their, their rulerships and what they did and they're boasting about how they conquered this nation, conquered that one, conquered another one. Yeah, it gives you all of that. Plus, we've got the huge tab you know, wall uh, stealers or tablets. You can see them in the British Museum of these Assyrian um, battles and fighting lions and full of inscriptions in cuneiform, which at the time, you know, back in the early uh, uh, 19th century were unreadable. But this library, when it was recovered uh, from the ashes of uh, Nimrod, uh, Nimrod Palace at, at Nineveh, um, they were able to take all these tablets written in cuneiform and we will talk about how they broke the code of the cuneiform but they were able to read there and are still decoding those to this day but a lot have been decoded perhaps 30,000 of these tablets have been decoded um, so we know a lot about Assyrian history and it dovetails exactly into what the Bible tells us so it's no longer, you know, justified to be sceptical about biblical history. What's told us there is all connected, and we can see it from the uh, Assyrian archives, as well as some things the Egyptians have to tell us, um, also about their history and how that um, links in with biblical history. So it's all there. And he's gone to these sources, these tablets, to uncover all this. The pamphlet, The Lost Tribes Found in the Assyrian Archives, covered the deportations of Israel by the Assyrians. That's the um, particularly northern Israel. Um, they also made use of spy reports. And these inform us of how some of the Israelites escaped. They went northwards to become known to history as Chimerioi, i.e. Chimerians, and these would later invade Europe where they were known variously as Cymru, Gauls and Celts. The, the Welsh still call themselves Cymru, um, but the name Wales in French is Gales, which means the land of the Gauls, Pays de Gales. Um, the Celts comes from Keltoi, and that's another deri derivation again from Gale, um, which was the Greek name for the Gauls and came from Chim the Chimerians, the Chimerioi, 
Now, I've covered this subject in detail in the previous program in the series under the title The Lost Tribes of Israel Go to Europe. I will therefore say no more about the Chimerians here. The second of Filmer's pamphlets is called Our Scythian Ancestors. In this paper he makes the connection between a further wave of lost tribes known to the later Assyrians as Iskuzi, to the Persians as Sake and to the Greeks as Scythae, or in English Scythians. In this lecture we're going to investigate Filmer's evidence and see how these Scythians became the ancestors of the Anglo-Saxons. I should just say that um, we, use, we use the word Scythian, but it should really be Scythian. <laughs> In the Greek, it's a K, not a C, and it's a hard sk, a K, not a S. So we shouldn't really be using a C, we should be using a, a, sk, a K. And in Greek, they're the Scute, and you can see where the name Scots comes from. They're the Scute. They know that. They knew, knew that there was Scute. It's actually written in um, the Declaration of Our Broth, is it? I think it's called, uh, when um, Robert the Bruce de declared Scotland uh, was separate from England and, and rebelled against Edward I. Uh, you know, the, that's all in there. They, they say we know that we are Scute. So we can go into that another time, but... Um, that we should not really be calling them Scythians, we should be calling them Scythians, or Scute. So, now the Assyrian archives preserved in the library of Esarhaddon tell us of the Iskuzi, who lived side by side with the Gimri and the Medes, and the Made, I should say, uh, Man in the Made, they call Made in Medes, and this part of Media was called Mane. So it's all a bit confusing, but the western part of Media was called Mane, and that's where the Gimri went to, and is where the Iskuzi were put as well. But who were they? That's the Iskuzi. We know from the Bible that there were successive displacements of the Israelites into exile. The first was in 732 BC, from just part of the northern kingdom of Israel, and ten years later, the Assyrians returned and deported the rest of what had been the kingdom of Samaria. Were well, all of these Israelites uh, were Gim Gimri, or did some of at least identify themselves as Iskuzi? Now, I'll just stop here a second. I've discussed in previous lecture how Israel, the, the land of Israel, after the um, death of Solomon, the son of, of uh, King David, the kingdom was split in two. The northern part of Israel rebelled um, uh, under a king called Jero Jeroboam, <laughs> Jeroboam, or however you pronounce it. And the southern kingdom had their own king, the son of Solomon, who was Rehoboam. So the ten tribes separated from the other two. The two was, uh, were the tribe of Judah and the smaller tribe of Benjamin. And the, the, the southern kingdom of uh, Judah and Benjamin was known as Judea or Judah. And that's where the Jews come from. Um, but the northern kingdom of ten tribes was called Israel still. So it's confusing. When they talk about Israel, are they talking about pre-Solomon times, pre-David times, when it was all one united country? Or are they talking about just the northern part of Israel, which was retaining the name Israel, and was later also called Samaria? Um, and we'll come to that. But the, these, they had a king called Omri, who founded the city of Samaria. So the northern kingdom was often called Samaria as well. And the, the people from there, Samaritans. So you get that name thrown as, in as well. But basically when they use Israel, sometimes it's referring just to this northern part. And it gets a bit confusing. But they were carried off by the uh, Assyrians, this northern kingdom first. 
and later on the uh, Assyrians came back and they took some of the Judeans as well. They didn't, didn't take Jerusalem, but they took many of the towns and cities of the rest of Judah and they took them as well and put them with the other Israelites, uh, in, particularly in this province of Mane, uh, in, in Assyria, or in Media, I should say. So, uh, uh, ten years later, the Assyrians returned and deported the rest of what had been the kingdom of Samaria. Well, I'll explain what Samaria is. Well, all of these Israelites, Gimri, or did some at least identify as Iskuzi, and we'll come to that. Historically, the first mention of the Iskuzi uh, is in certain Assyrian politico-religious texts. In these, Esarhaddon makes inquiries of the sun god Shamash. The king has sent envoys to Mane to collect tribute, but they have run into opposition. We learn that Esarhaddon's troops have not only had to contend with the Mane, but also with the Gimri and the Iskuzi. So who were the Iskuzi? Now, before we uh, move on, I should just say that when he's going to talk to the sun god, this means he's having some sort of oracle. Um, maybe there's a priest or priestess or something, they throw bones or something, or read oxes, livers, or whatever they did. Um, like the Babylonians, the Assyrians were very superstitious. And so he wanted to know what was the, you know, the outcome, what was going on with these uh, people fighting back and, and not paying their taxes and rebelling against his power and against his influence. So that's where we get the first mention of the Escuzi as being there along with the Mane and the, um, the Gimri or Gimir, who were the Chimerians, uh, in this province. Um, and that's the first mention we have in history of people, the Iskuzi, who are the Scythians. So, let's go back here. Filmer contends that the Assyrian name Iskuzi derives from the Hebrew Yitzhak, or Isaac, in English, Isaac was, of course, the son of Abraham and the father of Jacob, Israel. So to call the Israelites Isaacites, or Iskuzi in Assyria, is not wrong. You know, referring to their grandfather, you know, the, the father of, um, of Israel, uh, Isaac. He makes the point that in the book of Amos, and Amos is one of the, the minor prophets in the Bible, there are prophecies for Israel that also refer to the descendants of Isaac. Amos lived in the 8th century BC and accurately foretold of the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. He went to Bethel, the sacred centre of this kingdom, and argued with the high priest. So Amos is from the southern kingdom of Judah, but he's gone north to give a lecture to the priests of Bethel. Bethel it was the sort of holy place of the northern kingdom, largely because that, that was where uh, Jacob had his vision of the uh, ladder going up to heaven and the angels going up and down while he had his head resting on the pillow stone. Um, and the place was originally called Luz, but he changed its name to Bethel, the house of God. So that's what Bethel means. So it's a very holy place to the Israelites. And they, obviously they had um, sort of some kind of temples and things there. that uh, No priests there. And that's who Amos is going to give a lecture to. In particular, Philmer draws attention to chapter 7 of Amos. And I recommend you read that. It's an interesting book. Um, not very long. In this verse, Amos scolds the high priest at Bethel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. Now he's quoting what the Lord is saying. You, and he's addressing Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. So you say, and this is what uh, Amaziah is saying, 
Do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. So he's talking about the house of Isaac. And that's in Amos. And from this we know that the Israelites were sometimes known as the house of Isaac. And Amos then goes on to prophesy that not only will ten tribe Israel be driven from the land, but the priest's own wife will be driven to prostitution. So that's Amaziah's wife. It's a no holds barred prophecy. And it certainly came true that Israel was driven from the land with many deaths. Yeah, if you read that chapter and it tells you, you know, there's going to be terrible destruction and loads of deaths and it's going to be horrid. Um, you know, I don't think um, uh, he was very popular there, you know, Amos, in the place of Bethel uh, at the time. The Bible also relates that in the preceding generation, Sennacherib, as well as deporting Israelites from the north, also raided the southern kingdom of Judah. Yeah, we know that he did this. Um, he then deported the bulk of the Judeans, leaving only the city of Jerusalem. So I'll just say a couple of words here. Um, if you go into the British Museum, you can see these big Assyrian slabs. And um, the, one of these slabs is all about the siege of Kadesh. And the Assyrians are, it's a, it's a, a sort of narrative in, in a single picture is actually like a cartoon series. And it shows you, first of all, the Assyrians coming in and sieging the city and then them, you know, deporting the people and taking them away. So this was a city in Judah. So we see here, you know, this did happen. They, they came to Judah as well as Israel and they deported the Judeans, except for Jerusalem. The, the, the army, you know, the Syrian army went round to siege Jerusalem. But in the Bible, it tells us that they were struck down by an angel and they had to retire. Um, other people would say, well, they got dysentery or something and it, it, it stopped them in their tracks. I don't know the truth on that, but probably both is true. That's what the angel did. Gave them dysentery um, or cholera or something. But they, they anyway, they gave up. So Jerusalem remained. And probably there were quite a few people in Jerusalem at the time who would come from the, the, the rest of Judea. So it wouldn't be just the standing population of Jerusalem that remained, there would be quite a few others in there as well. Uh, and eventually they're carried off to Babylon, but that's a whole other story, and it's not, not to do with the Assyrians. So the captives from Judah, captives from Judah were placed with the rest of the Israelites. So were the Escusa these Judeans? That's a good question, isn't it? Filmer points out that Herodotus, the Greek historian, informs us that the Persians called all Scythians Sake, Saka. Now, Herodotus lived 484 to 425 BC, that's much later. Unfortunately, Herodotus, not knowing any better, assumed that the Scythians, or Scythae, came originally from southern Russia, east of the Caspian Sea migrating southwards through the Caucasus to occupy Media. However, there's no evidence for this migration southwards. Now, I'll just say a couple of words here. As I say, what I'm telling you here on Filmer's work is very controversial as far as the mainstream is concerned, but it all goes back to Herodotus, because the Scythians didn't leave writing behind them, and... Yes, there were but nomads, obviously, in southern Siberia, you know, Mongolia, these places from the far, far east. But are they really the Scythians uh, for real, or is this just what Herodotus was assuming? And you don't find the same grave goods and things. You do find, you know, tumulus graves uh, out there. And they have been archaeologically investigated, one quite recently, I believe. But they're not the same grave goods that you would find in the later Scythian tombs. Uh, you know, 
in um, Ukraine and other places like that. So there's no reason to believe that they're the same people as these tribesmen in the far, far east, uh, you know, that uh, he's worried about. Now, the false mi this is, I'm now going to give you the false migration theory, and, and uh, Filmer goes through this in, in some detail, so it's worth looking at. According to this false theory, the Scythians were wandering nomads from the steppes of southern Russia. Yeah, that's out here, that, you know, the Scythians did, and points east, other side of the Volga River. Um, going eastwards, they crossed the rivers Volga, Don and Dnieper. There's the Volga, there's the Don, and this, is, this one here is the Dnieper, which we are very familiar with now from what's happening in Ukraine and drove out the Chimerians. This is what, you know, the false theory says. So Chimerians happily living here, um, and they're now driven out by the Scythians. So the Chimerians were then driven west, southwards into Crimea. Uh, yes, they drive out, the Scythians drive out the Chimerians, they go down here, the Chimerians, cross over the Kersh Strait, cross over the Caucasus Mountains, and end up... Um, and then supposed to split into three groups, one group going west into Anatolia. This is Anatolia here. So one group going here, another group uh, going down into Assyria, and the third group into Media. So that, that's how they account in the false theory for the Gimri being down here. Uh, well, they're not. The Gimri are the lost tribes of Israel, um, the Gamir. So the, the, the house of Omri, bit Gumri, becomes Gemir. Um, that's, uh, you know, what the Assyrian archives tell us. So this is the false theory um, going on there. This alleged migration of both the Scythians and Chimerians is nonsense. No evidence has been found in southern Russia for prior Scythian inhabitation east of the Volga. Yes, they find tombs they might find the odd sword or whatever but that could be anyone's it, it, it doesn't because they believe that that's where the Scythians were they assume that these grave goods are Scythian or Scythian um, but they're not finding the gold stuff and all that which is typical Scythian which you find actually over in this area here and and, and here so to cover their tracks, it is claimed that when he writes that uh, Herodotus, when he writes that the Chimerians went south across the Araxes River, he must have meant the Volga. So, when he says, when Herodotus says that they did, they the Chimerians came down here and went over. Uh, sorry, when he says the Scythians crossed over the the Volga, uh, he's really referring to going over the Araxes. It's all, you know, a whole mess has been made of this because they don't know the real thing. There was no evidence for any of this, but the whole situation clears up once it's realised that the Scythians were not from southern Russia but were entirely different people. They were, like the Chimerians, descendants of the Israelites deported to Media by the Assyrians. And as you shall see, the subsequent migration of the Escusi was in the reverse direction to this fictional version derived from Herodotus. So that's the false theory. Now we're going to look at the real theory, what really happened. So to help us in this, we need to look at certain other inscriptions. And this is a Persian inscription at a place called uh, Behistun, where the kings of Persia had their tombs. And you can see here they're celebrating all these people that they've made captive and that sort of thing. Typical uh, of uh, Assyrians as well as Persians would do this sort of thing in their art. And we he see here this uh, flying, I think it's called a Fravati, uh, represents a, a Hura Mazda, uh, the god of the Persians, a high god, god of light, hovering above. And there are these inscriptions on the walls, and they're in three different languages. 
And we'll come to that. Prior to what Herodotus, uh, when Herodotus was writing, the Persians had conquered almost the entire Near East from Egypt to Afghanistan. The Persian kings built royal tombs at Behistun in western Iran. Some of these tombs, and also inscribed the tomb of, uh, inside the tomb of Darius, they are trilingual inscriptions. The three languages are Babylonian, which is almost the same as Assyrian, Old Persian and New Persian. So we've got trilingual inscriptions, and because we know sort of new Persian, we can then uh, work out old Persian, more importantly the Babylonian, and hence the Assyrian. This can be translated backwards. It's sort of uh, um, like the Rosetta Stone did for Egypt, where they had uh, the hieroglyphs, and then they had the hieratic, and they had the Greek. And you could use the Greek text to uh, it, translate the... Uh, the hieroglyphs and the hieratic. Well, you can do the same here um, with the Old Persian and uh, the Babylonian. And the trilingual inscriptions are like a Persian Rosetta Stone. Just as the Rosetta Stone enabled Champollion to decipher the hieroglyphs of Egypt, so these inscriptions enabled the deciphering of the cuneiform script of the Near East. And from these inscriptions, we know that the Babylonians referred to both the Cymri and Iskuzi as Gimri. So as far as the Persians are concerned, uh, they're all Gimri. <laughs> um, and the Persians called them Saka. So they, they called the, the Gimri and the Cymri as, by the term Saka, which the Greeks translated as Scythe or Scythians. So that's where, you know, the Scythe the name comes from the Saka, but you can see that um, the Saxons, also the name comes from that. But we'll come to them in due course. As we saw earlier, the name Iskuzi and Saka appear to be derived from the patronym Isaac. He was the father of Jacob, Israel, and the son of Abraham. So that first eye... Um, Easily lost. I mean, in a lot of these languages, if you have an I at the beginning of the word, they don't pronounce it. So that he could just be pronounced Sak and Sacha, the, the Isaac people, uh, as the son of Abraham. The reason for this difference from Gimri, etc., might be that unlike the Gimri, the Iskuzi included many of the Judeans, who were deported by Sennacherib. Now, I'll explain that to you. The Judeans were not Bit Qumri from northern Israel. So the Bit Qumri, as we, uh, in the last lecture we saw about this, how they, they're called Bit Qumri by the Assyrians, the people they've transferred, and that comes from Qumri, who was this king of northern uh, Israel who founded Samaria. So they looked upon all of the northern Israelites as being the house of Omri, Bit Qumri. Uh, but the Judeans were not from that northern kingdom and they had nothing to do with Samaria. But both groups were sons of Isaac. They didn't, want, they didn't use the Israel term, term necessarily because that was still confusing. But choose Isaac and that includes everyone, doesn't it? So they may have preferred to be known collectively as Iskuzi, or Saka, i.e. Isaacites, to avoid confusion with just the lost tribes of northern Israel alone. So that's why I think they could um, have uh, chosen to use this Isaac name uh, among themselves. We're all Isaac people, um, to avoid the confusion of who's... Uh, uh, Judean and who's an Israelite from the northern kingdom they're all Israelites really but they want to avoid being lumped in uh, as Gimri uh, if they're Judeans that's what I think and, and the Gimri they're also Isaacites so it's not a problem it's a more collective term for them that's what I think uh, happened and it could also be that there were some people taken from the kingdom of Edom I don't know if that's true, 
But Edom, uh, you know, is a bit south of Judah, um, on the other side of the Dead Sea. And uh, the Edomites were descended from Esau, uh, Jacob, Israel's brother. But he was also a son of Isaac. So if there were some Edomites in, among them, uh, they would also be Isaacites. So everybody's happy. <laughs> Filmer himself concludes, It is therefore not unreasonable to believe that the Iskuzi and the Gimri were both in fact Israelite exiles. We have already discussed in the previous lecture how the Gimri Chimerians migrated to Europe to become known as Gauls or Celts. The question now arises, what became of the Iskuzi? Well, as discussed, during the reign of Assyrian king Esarhaddon, 681 to 669 BC, the Israelites who were still in Media made common cause with the Medes, uh, or particularly the Mane people of, from that part of Media, and, and we're talking about this area here. Um, so this is Lake Umir, Ermia here, and this part here, uh, that side of the Caspian Sea, in this part of Media. Media exchange, extends all across here in uh, northern Iran. So this part is called Mane, and there's been a, you know, we talked about quite a bit about that in um, the last uh, talk I did talking about the Chimerians. But anyway, they made common cause with the Medes of there, the Mane to attack tax-collecting expeditions sent to him, uh, by him to media. So the king sends his tax collectors, they get beaten up in this area, and come back and say, oh, we can't get your taxes, king, um, because of these horrid people, they won't pay up. To stop these attacks, Esarhaddon made an alliance with King Bartatua of the Iskuzi. To seal this covenant, Esarhaddon gave one of his daughters in marriage to this king. So this alliance gave the Iskuzi, the Saka, enormous power and influence in media. So basically he's saying to this, the Saka or the Iskuzi, look, you administer this province for me, uh, Mane, and uh, have my daughter in marriage. We're allies, we're going to work, work together and... Uh, you, you keep the peace there, stop anyone else attacking me, um, we'll be allied and we'll be good friends. So that's basically what happened. So Madayas, the son of Bartatua, who so that means he's also the son of this princess, so he's half Assyrian. Uh, so Madayas, the son of Bartatua, the Assyrian princess, increased Scythian power considerably so that they controlled Uratu as well as Mane and Media. So the Scythians, they gained control over all of this and up, in, up into here as well. Uh, the the, the uh, Uratu stretched from here going out wet there and parts, parts around here I think as well. But um, Uratu was basically what we would now call Armenia. Legend has it that Madis, uh, that the Medes invited Madis and his nobility to a banquet, got them drunk and murdered them. <laughs> so, uh, for a time, these Scythians, uh, the uh, Sake, controlled all this area here, um, and they were very powerful, defeated the Medes. But the Namis invited them to a, you know, a banquet, got them drunk and murdered them. Night of the Long Knives. Some of the Scythians, during this, the time of the supremacy over Media, migrated further east, passing through Iran to Bactria. So some of them seem to have migrated across here. They, they already controlled Media and they went to Bactria, which actually was a bit further east. Than shown on this map, but on the Oxus River is a major river flowing down from the Himalayas and flows through northern Afghanistan. And at that time, it went to the Aral Sea. I think it doesn't go there anymore. I think it sort of branches off and 
and dies in the desert. <laughs> Over here, um, the, the, the path of the river has changed. But the Oxus River, the Amudaria, was um, a major river and a major civilization up there. What happened to these Israelites is not known. Very likely they are assimilated into the local population. So this is why you hear talk about uh, the lost tribe of Israel being in um, Afghanistan. Well, maybe some of them did you know, blend into the population there. This seems to be what causes the confusion about Scythian origins. They didn't come from the Russian steppes, but went east to Afghanistan and maybe moved northwards from there by following the Oxus River to the Aral Sea. So you can see, if they'd gone here, they could have gone up the Amudaria, the Oxus, all the way up to the Aral Sea, which is in southern Russia. So they can go up there, and then you are into this area where Herodotus thought that um, the Scythians came from. Uh, that might be part of the confusion. In 612 BC, the allied armies of the Medes and Babylonians attacked and sacked Nineveh. Here's Nineveh here, the capital of Assyria. With Assyria finally gone, the last Scythians were evicted from Sakis. Sakis is down here, this city here in, uh, in Mane. That, that's where they, they had their capital, Sakis. Or, this Saka in Sakis, it makes sense, doesn't it? And then they migrate north over the Araxes, and they go. They migrated north, settling in Sakasina, now part of Azerbaijan. So they settled in this province here of Sakasina. Sac where the Sake went, the Saxons. So they've gone up there, and that's between 625 and 525 BC. They settled here but for about 100 years. So one of the first places that the Scythians went to was the city of Taishbani, now called Kamir Blur. So Kamir Blur, I think that means um, Blue Mountain or something like that. Um, it was the, this uh, castle of Taishbani, and that, that was in Sakasin, on the Araxes River. It's a big river that flows through what was Armenia, Ratu, uh, into the Caspian Sea. So it settled here in this area, a very fertile, nice area to be. This fortress city had been founded by the Aratian king, Rusa II, in the mid-7th century, so probably around about 660 650 BC, so it's fairly new actually. It was sieged by the Scythians around 625. So the Scythians come up there, they lay siege to this, this castle that's obviously controlled this province of Sakasin, um, and they, they took it. Evidence of the siege are very visible in the archaeology of the site. So that's where what Camo Bleu looks like now when excavated. You can see all these ruins of what look like rooms and most of it's gone, but that's typical of ruins, isn't it? People quarry them for stone and stuff to do things with. Um, but that's that was on a mountain top overlooking this plain beyond the Sakasina. Um, and that had to be captured if they were going to take over that province. And Scythian arrows heads from the siege of Camir Blur in 625. There's masses of these. I've just shown a few here that I got off the internet. And they're typical Scythian arrowheads of their type. And they're inscribed bronze royal bowls from Camir Blur. Um, and 620, B, circa 620, well, it's actually 625, we think during the reign of Saradur III, king of Aratu. So this is royal stuff, his bowls, <laughs> inscribed with his, his name and things, uh, or whatever, in, in, his, in his bowls. Also found at Kamir Blur is this fragment of a helmet. It is distinctly Assyrian in style, showing two priests either side of a sacred tree. So those of you who are uh, in the college, I'll be, be familiar with this image of the, the 
holy tree of the Assyrians um, with a sort of ringlet of other things going on around it. I'm not going to go into, into that uh, symbolism here, but you, had, you have always two priests either side and they're holding these baskets or handbags or buckets or whatever they are, um, pointing, um, usually it's pine cones, they're po pointing at it. So this is very, very Assyrian. So given the Assyrian connection with the Scythians by virtue of the marriage of Bartatua to Esarhaddon's daughter, it is probably also Scythian in origin rather than Euratian. So I reckon this is something connected. It might even have belonged to this helmet, to the, a prince of, it wouldn't be Maddies, he was murdered by the Medes, but it might have been one of his sons or grandsons or whatever, um, uh, of this royal line going back to um, the Assyrians as well as to uh, the Scythian uh, ancestry. Now, at the beginning of the 6th century, the Scythians went through the Dariel Gorge from what is today Georgia into southern Russia. So here we have Sakasin. So they come out of Sakasin, they're going through the gorge to pass through. This is Georgia here, on this side, but you know, a bit west of Sakasin. But they're going through there. That's how you get through the Caucasus. You can go along the coastline of the Caspian Sea, but this is the main route that people always use. So the Dariel Gorge still links Georgia with southern Russia. In fact, we've seen pictures of uh, people escaping from Russia into Georgia at the start of the, this uh, Russian-Ukraine war. Young men from Russia who don't want to be conscripted have uh, streamed through, often with their families as well, through the Dariel Gorge to get into Georgia so they don't have to fight. And throughout history, this has been the principal way travellers and even whole armies have crossed through the Caucasus Mountains. So the Caucasus Mountains form a major barrier, um, seen as being um, uh, a sort of protecting barrier by the Russians. And that's one of the reasons why they want to uh, conquer Ukraine. They want to seal up the entrances to Russia. But that's another story as well. From 600 BC onwards, the Scythians poured through the Dariel Gorge into what is now southern Russia. So they've gone through, through the gorge here into here, into this area here, um, between the Caspian Sea and the, river, the uh, uh, Azov Sea. Uh, and you've got the River Don there and the River Volga there. So this is where they first go. Many Scythian artefacts dated to about 580 BC have been found in tombs in this region. So there's a lot of tombs being found in this sort of southern bit, quite close to the Caucasus uh, of uh, the Scythians. Having crossed through the Dariel Gorge, the Scythians moved into what is near Ukraine. Some went across the Kerch Strait, so they go this way. And they cross over the Kerch Strait. Um, others went further north, um, crossing the River Don. Yeah, so they go over. This is, you know, the River Don is here. So they cross over there and they settle around here, particularly on the north side of the Azov Sea um, and into eastern Ukraine. And between 525 and 150 BC, the Scythians migrated westwards, so they, they carry on their migration going westwards uh, through Ukraine. Now the route followed by the Scythians easily, is easily traced by the grave goods they left behind, so there's been a lot of excavating of graves. They were experts at casting gold and making swords, often their art featured horses or other animals. So you can see there's a, a skin of some kind of sheep, I think, and this is probably being used for uh, getting gold in Georgia. <laughs> you remember the, uh, uh, they called it Argos, didn't they? I think, was that right? 
the Argonauts went there. Now, Colchis, they called it, didn't they? Colchis. That was Georgia. And uh, you could get gold from the river. You put sheepskins in it and you you uh, use it for a bit of uh, gold mining. And you gather the gold in the sheepskin. It sinks, the, you know, in the water it sinks to the bottom and goes in caught up in your sheepskin. Then you take your sheepskin out and separate the gold from it. So they put, must have been doing that. But you can see that these guys themselves were bearded warriors with European features. I mean, just look at that guy's face there. Um, and these guys here. Uh, there they are. They're wearing trousers and they, they're, they're good archers as well, the Scythians. And they were excellent horsemen. So the, the other thing to note, that they're using this um, symbolic jewellery with animal heads and... and putting stones into the jewellery. Well, that's very typical of Anglo-Saxon art that you see with the various things that have been found in, in Britain uh, in, and in other places in Europe. Um, this sort of Scythian art that we associate uh, even with the Vikings as well. Um, and their swords. They were excellent swordsmiths. Um, now, when you think about it, these were supposedly nomads coming from southern Russia. And nomads are not the sort of people you would expect to become experts at um, casting gold <laughs> and making jewellery. I mean, they're moving around with their horses and, and, and carts or whatever. If they're nomads, um, this is the sort of thing you get from settled populations. Uh, but it would be typical, you would expect this sort of thing from people like the Israelites who had lived, you know, settled lives long before that and, and had a lot of gold at one time and had a lot of jewellery. It, it talks about that in the Bible. Uh, that's one reason why the Assyrians went there. They wanted to loot the place. Um, so they would have craftsmen capable of doing this sort of thing and those crafts could be passed down. Um, to their children, their children's children, and down through the generations, how you do this, that, and the other, how you make swords, how you do, you know, how you make jewellery, uh, and all that sort of thing. It's a tradition that they've carried on and passed down. Much more plausible than uh, if there were these warriors who poured out of southern Siberia, uh, raping and looting and, and doing whatever they wanted, uh, and then moving on, having you know, left a desert behind them. Um, no, that's not what the the Scythians, the Syrians were. Um, they were craftsmen as well as everything else and builders. Now then, between 200 and 100 BC, between 200 and 100 BC, the Scythians migrated into Western Europe settling mostly in Poland and Germany. There they go up here, there yeah, they cross over the Vistula, over the Oder, up to the Elbe. Um, you know, top of the Elbe, the Elbe you've got Hamburg, haven't you? Um, and you've got the Denmark Peninsula there. Um, so settling mostly in Poland and Germany, from here they moved into Denmark. So they go up here and into Denmark either displacing or amalgamating with the resident Chimerians, who are called the Cimbri. And we know from Roman records the Cimbri lived in Denmark, and they would join forces with other Gauls, and I think it was about 275 BC, or maybe it's a little earlier than that, they poured into Italy and seized Rome and looted it. <laughs> the Gauls looted Rome. You're not really taught that about that very much in history. Um, but there was a time when the Gauls actually looted the Romans instead of the other way around uh, in the earlier days of Rome. So they, these anyway, the Scythians came up here and they also settled on the coastline of just below Denmark into what's called Frisia. Um, and the Netherlands, which is Holland. <coughs> so they went all the way down there. 
The word Germanus in Latin means genuine, so Germanus, the Germans. The Romans knew the difference between genuine, i.e. Germani Scythians, as opposed to Sarmatians, who, coming also from Ukraine, settled in Hungary and Romania. So the Sarmatians were coming on their heels, and they may well have been uh, from the steppes coming in, but that they were a different bunch altogether. And they come down here and they go into Hungary and Romania. <coughs> and you've got the Celts in southern Europe by this time. They descended from the Chimerians. So the Scythians were now known simply as either Germans or Saxons, Sake. And they proved to be formidable foes who stopped Roman in expansion beyond the Rhine. So you had the Lost Legion and things in the Rhine, didn't you? Um, in the, the forest, I forget its name now, the, the Romans lost a whole legion. Um, and they really didn't venture into Germany after that. Uh, they, kept, they kept to what they'd already caught, in, uh, captured in Gaul, that's France, and Switzerland. And they did expand this way into Romania. That's where it gets its name from, isn't it? Romania, and into the Balkans, and Greece, of course. So they went eastwards quite a lot, but they, they avoided northern, northern Europe <coughs> uh, beyond the Rhine. So, as the Roman Empire came to its end, German tribes moved west to take it over. <laughs> so that, we have the fall of the Roman Empire, and these, suddenly all these tribes, these German tribes, different names, come pouring over the Rhine into France and into Spain, into Italy, um, and to take it over. And in the 5th century AD, different groups of Saxons began to invade and settle large parts of Britain. <coughs> so we can think about the Saxons, they were all, all of these are Saxons, but there are uh, there, there's different types of Saxons. You've got the Angles from southern Jutland, as we would call it now, this peninsula, and the Utes were from the northern part of Jutland. And the Utes came down, they were the first to come, Hengist and Horsa with their ships and their men. They, they took over Kent down here in the southeast tip of England, and they also took over the Isle of Wight and part of the Hampshire coast, this is the Jutes. And they were allied with the Frisians, so the Frisians were with them uh, as well. And then you had the Angles, the Angles from just south of Jutland, or the Jutes. They came in and they settled East Anglia, uh, also going up the coast. Actually, in this map, it doesn't show it fully clearly. They came all the way up here, um, you know, past Newcastle, and they, they actually Edinburgh. Uh, was eventually named after King Edwin, who was descended from the Angles, um, from this uh, from this area, from uh, York. So that part of Scotland was also settled by Angles, and, and all of down, down here. Um, and the Saxons of Germany settled the southeast, all the places that have. Sex in their name, Sussex, Essex, Middlesex, Wessex. So along with most of Western England, ex excluding for a time Devon and Cornwall. So they, they settled all the way, way around here, except for they didn't take Kent. Not at that time anyway. Um, that was settled by the Jews. So that's how the, uh, you know, the, the British Israelites come about or at least part of it. Already living in Britain at the time were the ancient Britons, who were largely descended from the Cymri, who were Chimerians. So we've already had one wave, maybe more than one, of uh, the Chimerians coming in and settling at one time the whole of Britain. And they're now joined by the Scythi, or the Scythians, who re represent another wave of the, uh, the lost tribes coming in and uh, amalgamating with them 
For a long time, Wales, which is still called Cymru, uh, held out as a remnant of the old Cimmerian Britain. But this too was absorbed into England during the Middle Ages. So Wales became part of England, still is. I mean, yes, it's still a principality, but it's, it's actually by law, it's part of the, the crown of England, under the crown of England. And today the Welsh language remains as a remnant of old Wales. And DNA testing reveals that there is actually not much difference between the Welsh and English. And one surprising discovery is the British shared 70% of the genetics of Tutankhamun, far more than the modern Egyptians at 2%. Um, perhaps this too has something to do with Israelite inheritance. Now, that's where I'm going to end this. So, um, I hope you enjoyed this. It's been a fairly quick, uh, I've had to keep it simple, um, this whole analysis. But I've given you the gist of it, and you can play around with that. And as I say, you can find this pamphlet on the internet. And I recommend you do that. Have a look and read through that. And you can take take it further and you'll see what I've been talking about in detail. It, it, it's actually, uh, he gives a bit more uh, interesting material as well. It's, I haven't covered absolutely everything he goes into. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and uh, in the next lecture, we will look into the Bible prophecies to see how many of the prophecies regarding Israel support narrative that the lost tribes migrated to Europe and especially to the British Isles. And that's particularly important now, because, as you know, if you've been following my lectures, I'm very much a believer that we are living in the last days at the moment, uh, in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going to see major uh, transformations. In the, I, th I think it might happen in the next few years, uh, within my lifetime. But if it doesn't, I don't think it's going to be more than, you know, you know, a few decades at the most, that you're going to see all of the things that are, are proclaimed in the Bible. So, and part of that has to be the rediscovery of the lost tribes of Israel, where they went to and what happened, why. Um, and that's all tied in with this. Um, once you realise that they went to Europe, and you realise that Europe was the home of Christianity... Yes, I know it started in the East, but it was more or less wiped out there by the Muslims. And maybe the same thing going to happen in Europe, I don't know. But um, the, uh, that's where they went. And uh, that's important for understanding why it's important for us to embrace our Christian religion, which is the fulfilment um, of both the Old and the New Testament. New Testaments, and our expectation of the re return of Jesus uh, in some time, I think, in the not-too-distant future. So thank you for listening, and uh, we'll meet again. <laughs>